China takes on globalism. Adjust your retirement plans accordingly. Um, <laughs> it's uh, the next 40 years. It, I don't know, but I don't know. I don't know. But I, I look at the 60s and 70s and I see the 50s, 60s and 70s. I think that's I look at the 70s, actually, and where we're going without question. I know a lot of people think, oh, Carter, you know, inflation, Nixon. I don't think it's that at all. I think it's a, the day of cheap goods is uh, quickly coming to an end. And, uh, and China is leading the way. Now, the question that remains is what will India do to fill the gap? Will they? I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. But anyway, let's read this. This is just fascinating. So this is on VoxDay.net. Huge fan. I've just recently discovered this guy. Freaking huge fan of this guy. And I'm going to read you some of this because it's... Uh, it's and we'll close it up here in just a second. Just bear with me. The fourth ideology. Very, very few in the West will understand the significance of this historic resolution passed by the Communist Party of China as most recent plenary plenary session. And here's the uh, thing right here. Xi Jinping cements his status with historic resolution. And this is just from a couple of days ago. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has passed a historical resolution cementing Xi Jinping's status in political history. Um, it is only a third of its kind since the founding of the party. The first was Mao, the second was Deng Xiaoping, Deng, Deng Xiaoping and now Xi Jinping. So let's read what Vox has to say about this. Um, it was passed on Thursday at the sixth plenary secession, one of China's most important political meetings. As only the third Chinese leader to have issued such a resolution, the move aims to establish Mr. Xi as an equal party founder to Mao or Deng. Just like the previous two resolutions, this resolution will play an important role in helping to unite the theory, will, and action of the party to achieve future progress in the realizing of the second centenary goal of the great Chinese dream of rejuvenation. So Vox says, what this action signifies is that China's ideology which hasn't been Maoist since 1978 and is officially no longer Dengist either. Deng, yeah, Deng. This third adaption marks the triumph of the brilliant Wang Huning, China's chief ideologist and the architecture of new Jiist ideology that re rejects Western influenced Dengist economics, economics first approach that has been officially the party line since Mao's successor rejected Marxism and publicly declared that to get rich is glorious in 1978. The commies have traditionally recognized three political cultures, traditional Confucianism, Marxism, as interpreted by Mao, and communo-corporatism, as interpreted by Deng. The globalists of the neoliberal world order loved Deng and were intimately involved in his formation. Consider how Soros described his own involvement with the bold reform agenda and Deng's conception of Chinese of China's place in the world. So here's from Soros, just October, August 14th. Mr. Xi came to power in 2013, but he was the beneficiary of the bold reform agenda of his previous of his predecessor, Deng Xiaoping, who had a very different concept of Chinese place in the world. Deng realized that the West was much more developed and China had had much learn, to learn from it. Far from being diametrically opposed to Western-dominated global system, Deng wanted China to rise within it. His approach worked wonders. China was accepted as a member of the World Trade Organization and the privileges that come with the status of a less developed country. China embarked on a period of unprecedented growth and even dealt with a global financial crisis better than the developed world. However, the highly influential Wang pointed out the flaws inherent in the third political culture in his famous text known as The Structure of Chinese Changing Political Culture. I'll let you read that. But so with the elevation of Jing, of Xiism, Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. So this is what the new theory is going to be. Uh, Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. Interesting. So it's not based on German Marxism. It's based on socialism with Chinese inputs. Uh, to, so Xi Jinping is now equal status with Mao and Deng, all right? And this signifies a complete rejection of what pres uh, presently passes for democracy as well as a neoliberal world order. That is why international corporations are fleeing China, why the chief executives of major Chinese corporations are stepping down in disgrace, 
And while globalist figures are furiously denouncing Xi as the latest new Hitler. Like Vladimir Putin, and unlike Donald Trump, Xi Jinping has successfully overcome the agents of the neoliberal world in order to defense of his nation. The official declaration marks the complete rejection of the globalist that first became apparent in 2015, when Xi uh, Jinping uh, publicly declined to provide what was intended to be a symbol of Sino-global, Chinese globalist unity by giving the offspring of Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg an honorary Chinese name. He said no. And that was the beginning of the end of the, uh, the, uh, of the globalist China. Nationalism is rising in China and everywhere, and this is a development to be celebrated by nationalists. While the Christian West is not China, and while China is not necessarily a friend of the Christian West, neither is China an enemy. To the contrary, China is now the most formidable enemy of that ancient evil that subjugated the Christian West. And what is the enemy of one's enemy, if not a friend? That's freaking as interesting as can be. Now, why do I say adjust your retirement plans accordingly? Because this is, is I want to do a separate video on this, but this is, is cash a good hedge risk against, a good risk hedge? And there's, yes, but I want to show you something here. All right, so here we got right here. We got this guy, some Nick Majuli, I don't know what his last name is. He says, look, probability of investments being down by over 5% by holding period. The probability of being down 5% during a 20 year period is zero. All right, so here's cash in black and here's uh, S&P 500 in green. 20 years, the S&P 500 has never been down 20%. All right, so they're saying, again, the stocks are the long term. Right. This is such an idiotic thing to say here. The probability of it being down less than 5% is, is zero. Well, we, ah, I just, I, we don't know this. Because you're extrapolating data from, we only have really 80 such years of data, 90 years of data, of which half those years were done when the U.S. was the only game in town. So we had U.S. coming out of World War I as, the only, as basically the emerging market that we were, went to the Great Depression, where it looked like even communist Russia was going to beat us back. From 1940, after the World War, uh, World War II, we were the only game in town. So somehow we managed to survive, which is good. Uh, which is good. I give uh, FDR credit uh, for saving capitalism, as I've done on uh, uh, previous videos. But from basically 1945 to basically 1980 or so, w w it was just the U.S. man. And everybody else was trying to follow us. And then we had this huge, massive globalization with Reagan, with just everybody. You know, China, you know, Deng, Reagan, Thatcher, uh, John Paul II. You know, I mean, everybody, just massive amounts of globalization. Free trade, quote, free, right. Free markets, free labor, cheap labor, massive immigration. Then we had the third wave of the Democrats uh, for Clinton and Tony Blair in the 1990s. So basically the first 40 years was uh, after World War I to basically 1980, the globalization craze of Reagan until now the 40 years. So we've had two 40-year completely different uh, structures. That's it. That's all we have. And to say there's a probability of any 20 years that your money is not worth less than 5% what you started with is zero. It's just freaking stupid. You just can't say that. You can say, yes, historically, it hasn't been the case, but that doesn't mean anything going forward. Now we're in the new dawn of an anti-globalism, a pro-nationalist uh, rise. No more cheap goods. No more cheap trade. No more cheap labor. Inflation, 100%. But inflation is not necessarily a bad thing if it's done correctly. Inflation because energy prices are going through the roof because freaking Joe Biden doesn't know his butt from a hole in the ground. That's bad. But inflation because employees have more say in the corporate profits and there's less freaking shipping of, uh, of assets and employment overseas and less getting cheap products from these countries that hate us anyway. That's not a bad thing. That's a good inflation. A bad inflation is what we're dealing with right now. So what does this mean for your stock and your retirement portfolio? Well, I'm going to go back and show you why cash is a great hedge. I won't go, I'm not going to do this in this video, but I will because I think it's wonderful. I think you have to start with the assumption that what was before is not going to be. That doesn't mean it's going to be all freaking, you know, we're living in a dystopian reality. It just means at the end of the day, the, the, you can't, well, you can do whatever you want. The previous two generations, well, it's be four generations, two 20-year time frames, post-World War I and then the globalization of the 1980s. That's not where we are going in the next 40 years. And the next 40 years, given what China is doing right now, I, the, the, 
the thing is India, you know, India is going to dwarf China in terms of people uh, by the end of the century. You know, I don't know, man, will India be, and you think of India, it's just a hodgepodge of different tribes, just like China was, just like Germany was. I mean, just like everything is. I don't know. I'm not sure what's going to happen in India. I do know there's a lot of freaking in, intellectual just titans in India, you know, basically redneck engineers and real engineers from India. There's a lot of freaking uh, muscle up there in terms of what they do. I, I watch them all the time on YouTube, They're taking flywheels and creating electricity to freaking do welding. It's, it's fantastic. How's that reflect, reflected in a mass global with cheap goods and cheap economy? I, I don't know. Cheap labor? I don't know. And then, of course, cheap labor means more profits of corporations which if you're invested with corporations you're doing great but is that gonna that doesn't have sustaining power no way no way anyway so uh so we shall see but this right here with china taking the new uh new road is uh is significant it's significant japan is now elevated to a first world country we're not getting cheap products from taiwan not getting cheap products from japan like when i was raised is uh cheap products from korea japan and taiwan and now it's China. Well, China's no longer that case either. And India, no. Where's it going to come from? Africa is the only real place. I mean, I guess you could say Pakistan. Do they oh, really? I mean, could you say uh, Thailand and stuff? Maybe. But is that, I mean, how many, China, Thailand is not China, all right? China has like a, over a billion people. Thailand doesn't. Malaysia, I suppose. You know, Singapore has gone nuts. Um it's just going to be a different world for the next 40 years. And you better adjust accordingly. The number one thing to do down there is to watch your expenses, man, and pay down debt. All right, we'll see you. I'd love to hear your thoughts.